It is nice to see all of you here this morning. And as Missy said, uh, we're in lesson four, and that's the parable of the vine dresser and the laborers. Uh, the overall theme of our study was serving. Uh, the actual act of doing it, our heart and our attitude towards it, and our reward for our service. Uh, those are the things that we're going to focus on today, so let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll read our, our verses. Lord God, we love you, and we did just thank you for drawing us here today, God, for allowing us to come and to worship you and to study your word and to fellowship with our sisters, God. Pray, Father, right now that you would remove any distractions from our hearts and from our minds. We just desire to receive everything that you have for each one of us, Lord, this morning. We thank you, Father, and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Matthew 20, 1 through 16. We're going to go for it. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard, and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said, because no one has hired us. So he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they received each a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more and they likewise received a denarius. When they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. And he answered one of them and said, Friends, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go away. I wish to give to this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is, this, or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few chosen. A lot of whining and complaining going on in there. So first we're going to look at the actual act of serving. Uh, serving is pretty simple. It's to perform a duty or a job or a responsibility. We know that there's always something that needs to be done right, and someone has to do it. Now, in the story, the task at hand was to harvest the crops before they spoiled. They only had one day to do that, so the landowner needed uh, servants to get that job done. Now, in your own life, what's the task before you? In your circle, what is it specifically that needs to get done? You know, there's so many different ways that each of us serves. We serve in our homes, we serve our husbands, we serve our children, our families, our pets. I only say that because my dogs have been naughty lately, and I've been just trying to serve them and love them, and they're rebelling a little bit. But uh, we serve in our workplace, we serve our community, and we serve in the church. Wherever the Lord has us, that's where we serve. And as believers in Christ, our life is a service to him. 1 Samuel 12, 24, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. Joshua 22, 5, But take careful heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him and to serve him with all your heart and soul. Romans 12, 11, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Now, I've been attending here at Calvary since uh, 2000, and I've served the Lord in many different ways over the years, many different ministries. 
Currently, I'm on staff as the office administrator here, and I serve under Pastor Raj and Pastor Tim and Pastor Steve. Um, I also serve in the devoted women's ministry under Missy and alongside the other leaders. I love serving. I love serving Jesus. I love encouraging others to serve Jesus. I love encouraging you ladies to serve Jesus. And you, you women are special. So many of you come up and you say, you know, what can I do for you? What do you need? What, how can I serve? You know, I have a free day, such and such. And it's such a blessing. The contrast is the men that I serve with on Sunday mornings. So we get here Sunday mornings about seven. Sue, she's here with her husband, they uh, are greeters. So I don't know if you see any of this, but we get here and we just get things ready for church and for the different ministries that take place. And I'm also Pastor Tim's assistant, so sometimes he'll give me things that need to be done on his behalf, um, tasks or whatever it is, and he'll say, can you go ask so-and-so, whatever it is. So I'll walk up to the men and they'll see me coming across the patio and they're all standing there in the lobby. And as soon as I come in, they start whispering and I'll walk up to whoever it is I need to do the task and uh, they'll just kind of be waiting for it and I'll say, hey, do you think you can do something for me? And they'll say, well, that depends. <laughs> what do you mean that depends? <laughs> Are you going to see if you like it or not and then you'll decide and if not, then you'll say no. So. I have to pull this and I don't like to use it, but I have to sometimes with them. I'll say, do you want to serve Jesus? And then they can't say no to that. So <laughs> have kind of a bad reputation with them, but that's okay. So now I hear them when I start coming, they'll say, just, tell, just do whatever she wants you to do. Otherwise she'll ask you if you want to serve Jesus. So that's how that happens on Sunday mornings. <laughs> so that's serving. Let's move on to our heart and our attitude when we serve. And I hope you ladies didn't think you're going to get off easy today. So in the parable, we know that different laborers were hired at different times of the day. Uh, maybe the landowner saw that the crops weren't going to be picked in time by sunset. So he went out and he got more help as he saw needed. So when it came time to get paid, the steward had everyone line up. Uh, from the ones that got there last all the way to the ones that got there first. And I'm just making this scenario up in my head, but can't you just picture the ones that were hired early in the morning, like all day as people are coming in, like working and looking over their shoulders and just probably thinking, oh, you know, they got here last and they're not going to get as much as us. And But then as they're going through the line and they see that they're all getting paid, you know, the same in a denarius, then they're changing, their thinking changes, and they start thinking, well, maybe we'll get more then since they got a denarius and they got here last. Just an aside, never compare yourself in ministry. That is a very dangerous thing to do. Just keep your head down and serve Jesus, and that's it. So now we start to see their heart and their true colors come out when they find out that they're all getting paid the same because they received a denarius just like the ones that were there for an hour and they weren't happy about it. So they confront the master and they start talking about what's fair and what's not fair and blah, blah, blah. And later we'll see the master's response to that. But let's talk about our heart when we're serving Jesus. What's our heart attitude? Philippians 2.14, do everything without grumbling or complaining. Some of your Bibles say disputing without arguing and disputing. I found this version in the NLV Bible. I don't know what that is, so I don't recommend it until we see if it's a good version, but I really like this one. <laughs> I'm keeping this in my pocket for those guys, by the way. <laughs> so this version says, be glad you can do the things that you should be doing. Do all things without arguing and talking about how you do not wish to do them. Oh, that is perfect. All right, so last Thursday, I was making my husband dinner. And he, um, he works in Tucson a couple times a month. He does a one-day turnaround, so it's a long day for him. And I had worked that afternoon, so I had gotten home kind of late also. So I was making dinner, and it was just about 7.30, which isn't awfully late, but it was late for us. And he's sitting over there at the table, 
and I'm making dinner and I look over at him and he's just smiling, just sitting there, just looking at me smiling. And I'm thinking, why is he smiling? And I just keep cooking and the more I look at him and see him smiling, he wasn't doing anything wrong, by the way. He's just sitting over there and I just start getting mad. And I'm like, what is he doing? Why doesn't he offer to help? I'm hungry, he's hungry, it's late. He's just sitting over there. And I, I'm not kidding you, I just started boiling. And I was getting so frustrated and I'm cutting up my squash and sauteing everything. And by the way, dinner took less than 20 minutes to make, so that wasn't the issue either. It's not like I had been slaving for two hours. So my heart and my attitude just went south really fast. And so I just started praying because I didn't know what was going on. And I just thought, Lord, what on earth? Why am I this angry at him for, you know, he's not doing anything at all. And then the Lord convicted me and I realized I was teaching on serving today. And so I thought, oh, there you go. Yeah. So ever since that, I've had pretty big challenge along the way. But so I apologized to my husband and our dinner was great and we're all good. But even in that, you know, even I love to serve my husband. I love to take care of him, um, take a lot of pride in that. And uh, I definitely don't ever want my heart to be wrong towards him. You know, it's just little things like that, not necessarily just serving in the church, but wherever you are in life, always guard your heart. Galatians 5.13 says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but, but through love serve one another. That love left my heart for a couple of minutes, but it came back. Pastor Raj on Sunday, he was talking about Paul and um, his service to the Lord, and he was talking about um, him persevering and pushing through those challenges and those hard things. Um, and you never heard Paul complain. He had a lot of change and a lot of uh, you know, things that he dealt with, and his eyes were always fixed on serving the Lord. When we serve, it should never be for recognition, uh, to be noticed, or even to be praised. Our gifts and talents and our abilities that we have come from him, and they should be used for him. And our main goal, and I feel like I say this every time I'm up here, but our main goal in our life, in using our gifts and talents, should always be to bring glory and honor to the Lord. And who is our greatest example and our model that we should be following. Jesus, that's right. Jesus was sinless, so we know he didn't complain or he didn't argue with the Father when he didn't want to do something. He was always so patient and kind with those whiny apostles and those grouchy Pharisees. He just served. He served when it was easy. He served when it was hard. He served when it seemed impossible. Because he was heavenly minded, his, his uh, thoughts were on the things of the Father, not on things of this earth. Jesus served the apostles in the upper room the night before his death. He washed their feet, which is an extremely humbling act, especially for the Son of God. Jesus served right up until he took his final breath on that cross. And I wanted to read a Devo that talks about that too. It's from Philippians 2.8. He humbled himself. One of the hardest things for a lofty and superior nature is to be under authority, to renounce his own will, and to take a place of subjection. But Christ took upon him the form of a servant, gave up his independence, his right to please himself, his liberty of choice, and after having from eternal ages known only to command, gave himself up only to obey. I have seen occasionally the man who was once a wealthy employer, a clerk in the same store. It was not an easy or graceful position, I assure you. But Jesus was such a perfect servant that his father said, Behold, my servant in whom my soul delighteth. All his life, his, watchful, his watchword was, the Son of Man came to minister. I am among you as he that doth serve. I can do nothing of myself, not my will but thine be done. Have you, beloved, learned the servant's place? And once more he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. 
His life was all a dying, and at last he gave up all to death, and also shame, and the death of the crucifixion. This last was the consummation of his love. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And that's our example. So let's move forward on to our reward for our service. We know that the laborers came and they complained to the master because they didn't think that it was fair that they all got the same wages when they felt that they had worked harder. But they agreed to the wage that the master had given them and he pointed that out. He had done nothing wrong. He hadn't broken any promises to them. His generosity was solely, blaze, solely based on his own decision and he didn't feel the need to explain it to them. He does feel the need to rebuke them, though, for their jealousy and their resentment. In verse 15, it says, It is not lawful for me, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? Now, in the Old Testament, the phrase evil eye was used to refer to jealousy. Uh, there are some references to that in Deuteronomy and in 1 Samuel. And an evil eye also was used by the ancient Jews to refer to someone who had an envious or a jealous disposition. Uh, they were discontent towards their neighbor's possessions. They loved their own money, and they would do nothing in the way of charity for God's sake. As women who love God, I hope that phrase is never said of us. So let's read our last verse, verse 16. And we're going to get to the application of the parable, which is the principle of God's reward. Matthew 20, 16. And this is Jesus speaking to his disciples now. He's done with the story, and now he's speaking to them. And says, so the last will be first, and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now, some commentaries... They think that this parable speaks of the way that people come to God at different stages of their life. Uh, they may come at the beginning of their life, they may come in their youth, in adulthood, in old age, or maybe at the very end. Other commentaries think that it refers to how the gospel first dawned with John the Baptist, the preaching of Jesus, the preaching at Pentecost, then to the Jews, and then to the Gentiles. But I think the overall uh, consensus was that it's best understood as a parable about grace and reward. So the last will be first and the first last. This is the essence of God's grace. When he rewards and blesses us according to his will and not according to what we deserve. The system of the law is pretty simple. You get what you deserve, right? But the system of grace can be foreign to us. God deals with us according to who he is and not according to who we are. And thank goodness for that, right? Especially after my little fit on Thursday. Jeez. God knows exactly what each of us needs. And his provisions for each of us are perfect. The grace that he gives to Missy wouldn't work for me. And the grace that he gives to me wouldn't work for Carrie. God also rewards based on our faithfulness in our service to him. Whether we're faithful for an hour, like those workers that came in the last hour, or we're faithful for 12. It's our faithfulness that he's interested in. Sometimes God may ask us to serve him in ways and for reasons that we don't understand, that make absolutely no sense to us, and you're like, okay, Lord, I don't, I don't know, but I'll do it. Have a story. A man was sleeping at night in his cabin when suddenly his room was filled with light, and God appeared. The Lord told the man he had work for him to do and showed him a large rock in front of his cabin. The Lord explained that the man was to push against the rock with all his might. So this the man did day after day. For many years, he toiled from sunup to sundown, his shoulders set squarely against the cold, massive surface, surface of the unmoving rock, pushing with all of his might. 
Each night, the man returned to his cabin sore and worn out, feeling that his whole day had been spent in vain. Since the man was showing discouragement, the adversary, Satan, decided to enter the picture by placing thoughts into the weary mind. You have been pushing against that rock for a long time, and it hasn't moved. Thus, he gave the man the impression that the task was impossible and that he was a failure. These thoughts discouraged and disheartened the man. Satan said, why kill yourself over this? Just put in your time, giving it just the minimum effort, and that will be good enough. That's what the weary man planned to do, but decided to make it a matter of prayer and take his troubled thoughts to the Lord. He said, I have labored long and hard in your service, putting all my strength to do that which you have asked. Yet after all this time, I have not even budged that rock by half a millimeter. What is wrong? Why am I failing? The Lord responded compassionately. My friend, when I asked you to serve me, you accepted. I told you that your task was to push against the rock with all your strength, which you have done. Never once did I mention to you that I expected you to move it. Your task was just to push. And now you come to me with your strength spent, thinking that you have failed. But is that really so? Look at yourself. Your arms are strong and muscled, your back sinewy and brown, your hands are callous from constant pressure, your legs have become massive and hard, through opposition you have grown much, and your abilities now surpass that which you used to have. True, you haven't moved the rock, but your calling was to be obedient and to push and to exercise your faith and trust in my wisdom. That you have done. And now, my friend, I will move the rock. We never know what God's doing through our service to him. You know, things that we don't understand that don't make sense. If he's called you or asked you to do it, just do it. And another aside, um, when we step out to serve the Lord, especially in maybe new ways, uh, different ways, the enemy is going to be right there. You know, he is going to be whispering in your ear, putting those thoughts and doubts in that you can't do it. You're not good enough. And those are exactly that lies coming from the enemy. So don't listen to that. Just do what God has called you to do and uh, just move, you know, move on, press forward. It's fun and it's exciting and it's hard and it's challenging and it's exhausting to serve the Lord at times. You know, and sometimes there's literal blood, sweat, and tears in serving him. But it's well worth it, and it's how he designed it. When it's hard, we draw our strength from him. We take up his yoke. We cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. And he blesses and rewards our diligence in ways that we don't deserve because he loves us. We serve such an amazing God. Why wouldn't we want to give him our best? Now, since I'm up here, I thought I'd take this opportunity because we do have some needs uh, for you ladies to step in and serve. Um, you can talk to me after our group time, you know, after 12, my table's over there. Um, we need some help Tuesday mornings. Uh, if you could come at 9 and help set up, there's a few of us that do that. Um, but we need some more. Uh, we also need the kitchen cleaned in the coffee shop. Um, I have one lady doing it, and I'd like another one to rotate that. And I have a couple other things that um, you might be able to do. So that's it. We'll go ahead and pray. <clears throat>